Good, good afternoon. It's wonderful to see everybody. Welcome to the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director with my husband, Frank Goodyear. And this afternoon, it's our pleasure to welcome Matthew McClendon, curator of modern and contemporary art at the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art at Florida State University where Matthew McClendon also teaches. Dr. McClendon's own academic training comes from FSU, where he did his undergraduate work, and from the Courtauld Institute of Art at the University of London, where he completed his MA and PhD. An exceptionally talented curator, Dr. McClendon is the organizer of Art Luc Dubois Now, which opened last week here at Bowdoin. Thanks to Matthew's powerful invocation of the term now in the exhibition's title, a word both resonant with Dubois' interest in temporality and an invocation to maintain a state of vigilance and attentiveness, the exhibition has continued to evolve, bringing in new works by the artist and demonstrating the exceptional insight McClendon has brought to his framing of Dubois' work. Among the pieces for which we are especially indebted to Matthew is to making available at, for us here at Bowdoin is Dubois' Circus Sarasota, a five-part video portrait featuring seven exceptionally talented performers with connections to the Ringling, which Matthew commissioned for his home institution. In addition to his work with Dubois, Dr. McClendon has worked with a broad range of contemporary artists, including overseeing installations and exhibitions by James Terrell, Stan Sanford Biggers, and Trenton Doyle Hancock, among many others. Dr. McClendon is a prolific author as well, who has overseen and contributed to publications, addressing not only the work of the artists I have already mentioned, but also the topic of hip hop, and visual art, futurism and the avant-garde, and the repurposing of discarded objects by artists such as Nick Cave, Aurora Robeson, Mac Primo, and Jill Sigmund. With a strong interest in the intersection between music, performance, and artistic, visual artistic practice, Dr. McClendon will speak with us today about our Luke Dubois on art and performance. Please join us in welcoming Matthew McClendon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say what an absolute delight and honor it is to be here with you all. This is my first trip to Maine. Um, everyone keeps apologizing for the weather, but it is um, 82 degrees and 80% humidity in Florida today, so I am thrilled to be in a little bit cooler. I don't mind the rain at all. It's really quite refreshing and lovely to be able to wear a jacket one more time before I have to put it away. Um, and I'm also, of course, thrilled to be here at Bowdoin um, and at the museum and so honored that you have um, brought Luc Dubois' work here. Um, I have to say also special thanks to Anne Collins Goodyear and Frank Goodyear. And um, that was the most beautiful introduction I have ever received, um, of course, from Anne. Um, and I hope that you know that not only do you have two of the most intelligent people working in the museum world anywhere today, you have the two nicest people working in the museum world anywhere today. I marvel at um, both of them. So thank you, um, thank you to Bowden, thank you to the museum, thank you to Caroline for helping make all this happen, and thank you to Luke, whom I'm sure some of you have already met and seen when um, the exhibition opened last week. So I am the curator of contemporary art in a place called The Ring Lane. And here, of course, we have our benefactors and namesakes, John and Mabel Ringling, um, looking very dashing, as they, as they always did. Um, very briefly, of course, uh, John and Mabel came from very humble backgrounds. 
um, but had a great deal of drive and vision, certainly John with the circus, um, and Mabel and John with the incredible vision they had in um, creating a real uh, oasis, I think we can say a cultural oasis, in Sarasota, Florida in the 1920s, um, what was, which was little more than a fishing village at the time. Uh, it certainly brings with it great benefits, uh, being at a place called the Ringling, uh, but also some challenges. Ringling is of one of the most recognizable brands in America, really in the world. Um, and of course, anytime you hear that name, you immediately think of the circus. Uh, and here we have John, his name got cut off, unfortunately. Um, you think of the circus. Here we have one of, one of our three circus museums. Um, yeah, I'm the curator in the Museum of Art, uh, but you know, even my, my own mother has been known to slip up occasionally and tell people that her son is the curator at the Ringling Brothers Museum, which is a very different experience. Here we have a great vintage photograph, and this is John and Mabel's uh, private Pullman train car that they traveled by. So we have a very, of course, strong circus heritage at the Ring Lane. Um, if we're lucky, the next thing that might come to mind when you hear the Ring Lane Museum, oops, one more of the circus, is our great old master collection. Uh, John Ringling decided in the 1920s to very quickly, uh, very aggressively, amass a great collection of European art, just like many of the other American industrialists before him. Certainly we can uh, uh, think of any number of motives of legitimization and, and making your mark on the world. Um, perhaps shrewdly, he chose to collect uh, Baroque art at a time when Baroque art was wholly undervalued uh, in this country. Here we have a gallery too, which has three, uh, you can see it has four of the great Rubens paintings. You can see three of them in this, inst in this shot. Um, here is Abraham and Melchizedek, probably the grandest of the Ringling paintings. Again, we um, can speculate as to any number of reasons that John and Mabel decided to collect primarily Italian and Flemish Baroque art. As you can see um, in, this, in this image, the paintings are very large. He needed to fill a lot of space very quickly. He was building a museum. They are Baroque in every sense of the word. There is a lot going on. They are spectacular. This is a man who made the circus even more spectacular, so perhaps there was some kind of aesthetic affinity there. Um, John and Mabel loved Italy, they loved Europe, they loved Italy in particular, um, the, the drama of Italy, the drama of Italian painting and Flemish painting here. Um, so we can, we can speculate as to any number of reasons. I think it's probably all of the above to some degree. Um, finally, what might come to mind after the Old Master collection, is the beautiful estate itself. And here you have the Cadizan, which in Venetian dialect means House of John, that we lovingly refer to as Venetian Gothic in style. Um, it is a wonderful pastiche of Americans going to Europe in the 1920s and being amazed by it and deciding that they wanted one of everything and coming back and in a very loving, very beautiful way, uh, making that a reality on Sarasota Bay. And perhaps if you're a flower aficionado, you might know of or come to visit Mabel's Rose Garden, one of the longest continuous rose gardens in the United States. So all of these things um, come to mind, I would argue, when people around the country or around the world um, hear John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art. All of this is to say that contemporary art being produced by being produced now and by living artists is not the first thing which comes to your mind. So I was hired six years ago to, if not change these associations, at least add a new one to the collective psyche. Uh, but I'm always very mindful in my curatorial practice um, that I am a contemporary curator, not at a MoMA, a Museum of Modern Art, not at an Institute of Contemporary Art, but within a museum and a state with a rich heritage of both the loftiest of quote unquote high art as well as being in the shadow of literally the greatest show on earth. 
So how do you compete with that? Well, of course, the answer is you don't. You work with it and you honor it, and that is probably the greatest delight of my job. When I first arrived at the Ringling, one of the first installations I did was work by an artist named Yinka Shonabare, who uh, is based in London, absolutely fascinating contemporary artist dealing with post-colonial issues, uh, creates these mannequins with um, stereotypically, or I guess you could say African uh, fabrics that we associate with Africa, but are actually um, Western imports to Africa. Anyway, we had a, a number of, uh, of the mannequins of the sculptures that he creates that were child-sized in our period rooms, and uh, they looked a little bare, and I needed something else in those period rooms to go along with this installation by this great contemporary artist. And I had this wonderful realization that never again in my life, wherever I worked, would I be able to go to my museum's database and type in Tom Thumb, and immediately come up with page after page of artifacts of Tom Thumb, and be able to put Tom Thumb's marriage settee, which we had just been, had just been gifted to the ring lane as part of this wonderful juxtaposition of the, the old and the new, our circus heritage and our contemporary art. It's a, it's a very magical, special, whimsical place, and I'm very fortunate to be there. And so that's where someone like this guy, Luc Dubois, fits in. How do we come to present the first museum survey of this artist who is at the very forefront of the intersection of art and technology in service to what I would argue is the foundational function of art, which is teaching us about ourselves? Um, like most good stories, it starts at a dinner party. Uh, I found myself seated next to Luke at a dinner in Sarasota, um, I think sometime around 2011. And I am an art historian with a particular set of challenges. I do not remember names, and I do not remember dates. And if you see as I'm turning, I have dates scribbled all over my notes, because you'll ask me dates, and I won't know them. Um, so I was sitting next to Luke at this uh, dinner party, and I had absolutely no idea who Luke was. Um, as the evening went on, however, Luke began to talk about his work, and he and he provided an impromptu studio visit for the guests at the dinner party. Now, as a curator, um, I do studio visits all the time. It uh, necessitates me traveling usually to New York or Los Angeles or London or wherever. Um, the artist might be living in Miami. Um, and I go to their studio, and it can be a two, three hour process. It can be a half day process. It's a very um, intense labor um, associated with the studio visit, and of course, great joy and delight. A Luke studio visit consists of everyone gathering around his omnipresent MacBook, wherever you are in the world. Um, so this was in the living room of the couple who was hosting the dinner party in Sarasota in 2011, and we all gathered around, and I realized that I knew this work, and that I had been intrigued by this work for several years first learning of it in a profile on the former Dallas cheerleader and mega art collector, Amy Phelan, that I read in W Magazine, which for any students that there might be in the audience is a great lesson that you never know where your next good idea is going to come from. Um, and it was this project, uh, A More Perfect Union, that I knew most about because it had had a great deal of extensive media coverage when it premiered. Um, I, just a brief description of a more perfect union. Uh, in 2010, I believe, yeah, 2010, Luke joined 21 online dating sites as a man, woman, gay, straight, um, and downloaded um, 19 million profiles, around 19 million profiles, and created what was for him an alternate census to the US census, which was happening that year, a census of lonely hearts, he's called it. And the way it works is that each um, city on the map, the name of the city is replaced by the most used word um, in the dating profiles in that city. Um, so I've given you a, a New York, I did not have Maine on my computer, sorry. Um, so I'm giving you New York, and this is part of the reason the show is called Now, because New York, which you can't see, I'm sure, all the way down here, the most used word in dating profiles um, in New York is now. And of course, can you think of any more place 
on earth that is so insistently now about the present. Um, Luke has a great line that it's, it's not just about that, it's that everyone um, in New York is saying, I'm really an actor, but I'm waiting tables now. Um, and so it comes up a lot, but I think it certainly speaks more to the, the tenor and nature of New York than anything else. So it's, um, on the first look and on the surface, it's it's fun, it's, it's funny, and a lot of Luke's work is very funny. Um, where I'm from in Florida, Sarasota, is boating, but a small town, small community, um, which is, that makes sense, of course, beautiful, a small community, very small community, just south of Sarasota, its word is aficionado, um, which just, be, I think, is endlessly interesting. Um, so on the surface, ha ha, but I'm bum, as Luke would say. But when you start to dig down into this and realize that a guy with insomnia um, sitting in his uh, first his home, his apartment and then his lab has access pretty easily to 19 million profiles and can download them all and um, do with them what he would like it starts to become a very um, almost a troubling or sinister meditation on data, data mining, um, uh, privacy, and what we're putting out there into the world. So I knew this work. I loved meeting Luke and learning about it. But then he showed me this work in the studio visit. And this is a pop icon Britney. And this work was new to me. Um, and as I'm a very proud to admit, I'm a huge fan of Britney Spears um, and, and know a lot about her and was great to find that Luke, also very interested in Britney Spears. Um, and this is called Pop Icon Britney uh, because it is a meditation on what we mean today, not traditionally, but today by the word icon, all that that um, holds within our cultural context. And the way this works is he took, um, at the time it was created, uh, every, uh, I think, extant image of, video of Britney Spears off the internet. She was by far one of the most, if not the most, um, photographed uh, personages in the world at that time, and then took every track uh, of, her, of her music and uh, put it through, he actually put the music through the reverberation of the Cathedral of San Vitale in Ravenna, one of the great cathedrals in Christendom, um, and then created this powerful video sonic collage, which again, I, I, don't, I have stills of all of this, um, because as I was saying earlier, I couldn't get anything to embed properly, so this is your push to go next door to the museum and see it in real life. Um, so this becomes fascinating uh, because Britney Spears is uh, one of the first pop stars to live completely in the digital age. You never, as Luke says, see or hear Britney Spears. Everything has been digitally manipulated. And what does that mean when we think in broader terms and perhaps in more historical terms of iconography? Well, it could mean a lot at a place like the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art, where because we uh, the historic collection is an old master European collection, we have a great deal of religious imagery in that collection. So I was, of course, just thinking in the first instances of meeting Luke about having this piece as an interjection in one of our galleries. And I wanted to put it next to this, the Blue Madonna, which is by a follower of Carlo Dolci, 16th, uh, 17th century, excuse me. Um, and easily the fan favorite painting of the Ringling. She is so popular, she has her own section in our gift store. And so, you know, being somewhat cheeky, as you've probably already cottoned on to, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we hung pop icon Britney next to the Blue Madonna? Again, ba dum bum. But, Again, as with so much of Luke's work and what makes it interesting is once you start drilling down into the layers and thinking about how we form icons today, how we raise people up to that status, how we ascribe personalities, traits to them, um, and how all of that is manipulated, it, I think it does become a very interesting dialogue with the past. And that's one of my key aims with contemporary art at the Ringling is using the work by contemporary living artists, which for much of our audience might seem more relatable, might seem more immediately um, 
uh, uh, meaningful in their lives or apropos to their lives, to then be in dialogue with the old master and the older collections of the Ringling to show that a work from the 17th century might be operating on some of the, with some of the same interests um, as a work from the 21st century. And we've had a great deal of luck, particularly with students and younger people, uh, making those connections. Quickly, however, I realized that there had never been a survey of Luke's work, and I was shocked by this. Here is one of, in my opinion, the most brilliant and intriguing artists I've seen anywhere in the world, and I felt he wasn't getting the institutional support that I thought he deserved. So we immediately went past just showing Brittany next to the Blue Madonna and started talking about a full-scale survey. And the fact that Luke has not had a survey within the museum, uh, I think, speaks to one of the key aspects of museum practice we are engaging with at the Ring Lane, and that is the museum, um, speaking very generally, is still set up very much on an 18th century model of taxonomy. We have curators of painting, we have curators of sculpture, now we have curators of film and photography, but never shall they meet. Um, and it's not only museums, this also has further ramifications with granting bodies. So that when you have an artist like Luke, who is working in film and music and performance and printmaking and installation, and he comes up to the museum as an institution or a funding body as an institution, who handles him? No one can figure it out. So I think more often than not, these artists are ignored and don't get the type of institutional support they need. We're very committed to these types of artists um, whose work we can maybe say is uh, intergenre in nature. Um, and it's perfect for the Ringling uh, because we also have a very, con uh, very dynamic contemporary performance program and lots of museums are exploring performance now, but unfortunately, like the curatorial departments, we find that those are so often siloed and that they're doing their own thing while the curators are doing something else. At the Ringling, we're very lucky. There are no silos. My, uh, the curator of performance at the Ringling is my closest colleague, and we plan pretty much everything together when, in, when we can. Um, and as I was preparing this talk, I mean, we have all sorts of lofty philosophical reasons for why we're building our program and modeling it on this way, modeling it this way. But of course, what is more intergenre than the circus itself? Um, so this, this was, of course, our leitmotif of the day because of the work I'll be talking about in depth. Um, but it certainly does speak to our heritage in that way as well. Um, and so this goes on to the performance and the performative nature of Luke's work. And early on in working with him, I was struck um, by his investigations of time, how we mark experience, how we mark the experience and the experience of time, and in particular, how an artist relates time to an audience um, specifically in performance. And I came to realize that Luke's experience of time is overwhelmingly, I think, influenced by his quote unquote other life, which is as a musician and a composer and a performer himself. And I think it's because um, he has this very rich history as a musician, composer, and performer that for musicians, Time becomes innate. Time becomes embodied. You have to feel time. When you are working with other musicians, when you are playing together, it is, um, it is uh, non-vocal. Uh, You're not speaking to one another. You are feeling one another. Um, and timing is everything for the musician. And I started to really investigate Luke's work uh, through that lens. The visual arts historically have done a really poor job at marking time and translating experience um, of the time-based into the static. More often than not, and I do love them, um, the Italian futurists, but more often than not, you get something rather clumsy, like this work by the futurist Bala. Now, the futurists were, of course, obsessed with motion. They weren't thinking necessarily in terms of time, but motion and time certainly are related. Um, or you get something like this, um, which is Salome by Robert Henry, one of my absolute favorite paintings in our collection at the Ringling. Um, but again, it is an impoverished uh, translation of performance. Henry actually had to invite Madame Wojcicka, who is pictured here, um, who danced the dance of the seven veils in Salome at the Met, back to his studio, and she is very much posed 
in quote unquote inaction. The Dance of the Seven Veils is evoked, but I would argue that the essence of the time-based performance um, has been wholly lost. It's, a, it's really a completely different experience. It is simply um, perhaps a record at best. And this is what really drives a lot of Luke's work. Of course, this begins to radically change with the introduction of electronic media. I'm not gonna go into citing Luke's work in that history because I know you have a talk coming up uh, shortly that will be uh, looking at that. So I will just be looking at Luke's work. Um, and one of the most profound, I think, uh, investigations of time in his work is the video piece Fashionably Late for the Relationship. Um, which is on view in the exhibition. And just very briefly, this was in 2007, 2008, um, there are two works of art at play and fashionably late. The first work of art is the performance piece by the performance artist Leon As Fuentes. And that performance piece took place on a traffic island in Union Square in New York over 72 hours, so over three days, over a July 4th weekend. Leon in the piece is exploring notions of femininity, of public and private space, of the obsessive gaze. Um, she was moving exceedingly, excessively slowly. So she would take, for instance, perhaps three hours to drink a cup of tea. Um, Luke then is filming this with uh, a very large film crew, a, a super high definition. And so the second work of art in Fashionably Late for the Relationship is the work of art that you see in the gallery. And that is the documentation of the, of the performance piece that Luke has created. And it's been sped up so that 72 hours is now a 72 minute movie. Um, one hour then equals one minute. One hour of action in real life equals one minute of action in the film three hours to, take, to drink a cup of tea in real life translates into three minutes in the film. One minute equals a second. Um, for Luke, this was a first um, major uh, experiment and investigation into the documenting of time-based performance, an attempt at providing, in his words, an equally engaging experience, realizing that it cannot be the same experience. He wants to create an equal, an equal but different experience. This work is carried on in a work like Vertical Music, also on display in the ex exhibition. This is perhaps a more literal attempt at translating time-based performance into an equally engaging experience. He wrote um, a, a chamber piece for 12 musicians that's four and a half minutes long recorded again with super high definition cameras and audio, and then played back at one tenth the speed, so four minutes and uh, uh, four and a half minutes roughly translates to 45 minutes um, in the actual video piece. And here he's really starting to look at perception and what it means to be in a performance. Um, and what we think we perceive in the performance. When you look at um, vertical music in the galleries and you're listening to it, of course you have a, an almost wholly abstracted soundscape happening. Um, but you start to find the connections with that soundscape with what's happening on the screen. And you realize like when you're looking at the stringed instruments, at this, at this rate and at this high definition, you see the string actually vibrating, creating the note that you're hearing. Something completely impossible when you're in the recital hall and you're listening to it in real time. So again, as the artist, he is interested in how he can manipulate the perception in such a way to provide a document that is an equal but wholly different experience of, of the live performance. Um, roughly at the same time, he was also working on this, and this is the Marigny Parade uh, for Prospect New Orleans. And it was this piece, more than any other, I think, that convinced me that I wanted to uh, commission Luke for a piece as part of his exhibition at the Ring Lane. Um, it's not in the exhibition for a number of reasons, but uh, there is a DVD that you can buy um, that is available on the market that you can uh, see the, re the recordings of this performance. Um, 
350 middle and middle school and high school students, a 50 person video and sound crew creating um, this incredible, again, documentation of live performance. And what you have is a number of bands all starting out in different places around Marigny, out in, uh, around New Orleans. And they're all starting in different places and they're starting at the same time and they're all synchronized via a radio click track. And they are all marching to converge at the same spot, a, a very popular park. But you are confronted as the audience, as the viewer, with, again, the kind of illusions or the assumptions we all make about performance, that when we are in a performance, we are experiencing the entirety of the performance. This is a performance that it is impossible to experience the entirety of. You can either choose to follow one of the bands as they are marching to the park, or you can wait in the park, and you can wait for their arrival as they all converge, but either way, you're ha having to make a selection. And even in the video documentation, you are still only provided a piece of the performance at any one time. I found this all you know, endlessly fascinating from a philosophical point of view, um, but what really interested me about Marigny was Luke's um, involvement with the community in creating, this, in creating this commissioned piece. He really involved himself with the community, he learned about the community, he talked and worked with the community, and the piece evolved out of that. I believe very passionately in commissioning artists, I don't believe in commissioning artworks. So it was important for me, um, after learning more about Luke's work, that he have complete and total artistic freedom in his commission and what he wanted to do, how he wanted to achieve it, what it would be, what he wanted to say with it. So Luke became our first artist in residence, visual artist in residence at the Ringling. And over the course of two years, he spent about three months give or take, in Sarasota, and he really did become a part of the community. And after spending a number of weeks in Sarasota, at the Ring Lane, in our archives, learning about our history, um, Luke, like so many artists uh, that come in and out of the Ring Lane in Sarasota, fell in love with the circus. Um, it was absolutely a surprise to me. I did not think that that's what he would choose, but of course when he chose it, it made perfect sense because of the performative aspect, because of the music, because of the spectacle, and all that Luke was interested in. He really came to the circus first, though, through the visual culture of the circus, um, through the visual culture on display in our circus museums, but also in our very important, we have one of the largest circus archives, and we have an incredible collection of circus posters, some of the most inventive, uh, inventive uh, visual language of the 19th and 20th century. Circus posters and the companies, particularly the Strobridge Lithography Company in Cincinnati, pushed printing techniques and mass production techniques to new extremes. And I think that's what really started to intrigue Luke. Here you have three of the posters from our collection. And it was first the, the visual culture, as I said, of the circus that um, really started to get his mind working. And what you see, some of the elements that you see in these posters that are then translated into the final project, Circus Sarasota, is you have um, in all of them what we might term simultaneous narrative. You have different actions from different points in time occurring within the same frame. This is an early attempt at animation, of course. This is a way of animating the scene, animating the, the spectator's imagination. Um, you also have wonderful typography and graphic elements in all of these posters, and we'll get back to that in a moment. And then in some of them, and this is one example, um, frequently some of the scenes or the performer being highlighted within the entire poster, the star, would be literally framed in some way. And in some cases, they would use frames that are very similar to what we associate with European Old Master, gilded, highly carved frames. So Luke started taking all this in. He worked with our circus curators. Um, he also became interested, again, back to the typography, in the other great tradition of visual culture, and that is Soviet 
um, Soviet so circus posters. The Soviet Union had a great circus tradition as well and employed many of their great avant-garde leading graphic designer, designers and artists in service to those circus posters. These are not in our collection and I had to pull these off the internet very quickly um, in making my, I have no idea what they say and if anything is offensive, I truly apologize. They're, they're totally chosen just as examples of graphic design. So Luke, um, Luke spent a year, I think his eighth grade year in the Soviet Union as an exchange student. So it had that interest and I think that that um, certainly played a part in this. And then um, as, a, as a performer, as a musician, he is a collaborative artist. He collaborated on the typeset design, which you'll see in the final, um, which you'll see in the final works of art uh, with a, a graphic designer and typographic designer, um, Ksenia Samarskaya, who's based in San Francisco, I believe. So a, a Russian herself. Um, so that all was the genesis. He was interested. This is what he was talking about. It all sounded great to me. I was actually very excited because I love the circus. I grew up loving the circus. Who doesn't? Um, and I, like I said, I was surprised that that's what Luke had decided he wanted his commission to be about. Um, but perhaps, I, I'm sure somewhat unwittingly, um, this was not um, perhaps the easiest choice for Luke to have made. Um, and this, th this talk is really about collaboration and performance and citing. And when I'm talking about citing, yes, it certainly makes perfect sense for Luke to choose the circus when he's doing a commission for a place called the Ring Lane, right? Um, because we are a site of the circus. John Ringling made Sarasota the international home of the circus. It's where circus performers from all over the world come to retire. It is where living circus performers live. He brought the winter quarters of the, John, uh, of the Ringling Brothers Circus to Sarasota in 1927. It's the first themed, big themed attraction in Florida. I imagine you can think of another big themed attraction in Florida. Um, John Ringling was the one that in many ways started that. So of course all of that makes sense with the literal site. But site can be more than the literal physical space. And I, I, I'm thinking um, perhaps superficially and taking this a bit out of context, but there's a brilliant art historian at uh, UCLA, Miwan Kwan, who deals a lot with, dealt a lot with site-specific sculpture and really expanded our notion of site in critical theory. And Perhaps unwittingly, Luke really entered into a much more expanded notion of sight in choosing the circus, a discursive notion of sight. Because circus performers, um, I think, come to Sarasota because they know that they are um, welcome there and they are included there and they are safe there and they have a very, very strong community there they do not necessarily always feel those things in the outside world because there have historically been negative associations. You run away to the circus. They are itinerant. They are traveling. They are without location. Um, I think in the popular imagination, somehow that becomes rootless and without family. They have the greatest roots and the greatest families of any people I have ever met in my life. They just all happen to be in the circus, which is itself not rooted. So I think, and I certainly do not want to speak for the circus community, um, but I think there have been moments where they have felt marginalized by the greater community and they have felt exploited by the greater community. So without even realizing it, Luke was entering into those politics. Now, very fortunately, I work at a place called the Ring Lane, which is legendary within the circus community for all the reasons that you can imagine. But it was very important for us to, for all of us involved in this project to approach it sensitively and to actually have the circus community or representatives of the circus community on board advising um, and being an integral part to the commission and the actual production of this itself. And that's where we come to these um, two people, two of the most extraordinary human beings I have ever had the pleasure to meet. On the left, we have Dolly Jacobs, the queen of the air. And on the right, we have uh, her husband, Pedro Reese, who is one of the great aerialists himself. 
Dolly and Pedro, Dolly still performs. That's her recently performing in Sarasota. Dolly and Pedro um, are the founders of something called the Circus Arts Conservatory. And that incorporates a number of things. It incorporates um, their one ring circus, Circus Sarasota, which happens in February usually in, in Sarasota. It also incorporates um, something called Sailor Circus, which I believe is the longest running after um, circus after school program for youth. And it's still generating um, circus uh, the next generation of circus stars and performers, and we'll see more about that in a moment. It's an incredible not-for-profit. They also do, the clowns do amazing work um, in retirement centers and with Alzheimer's patients and all kinds of just amazing work. But beyond that, Dolly and Pedro really are among the royalty of the American circus. So um, through my colleagues at the Ringling, who are circus curators and uh, in charge of that history, um, safeguarding that history. We were put in touch with Dolly and Pedro, Pedro in particular. Um, and it was then our job to make sure uh, that they understood that this was a work of art not in any way seeking to exploit or take advantage of these, of these great artists, but to raise them up to the level we, we think everyone um, should view them. Key to that um, and key to uh, my discussions with Luke um, was the understanding that this work, once it was premiered, would, would be premiered as part of the exhibition in the Museum of Art, not in the Circus Museum, which sounds perhaps um, very, uh, very basic or very trivial, but when you think of the wider implications of these great artists who are not always seen as artists by the outside world, who have dealt with the negative associations that we've just talked about, having them in an exhibition in the museum, the great John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art, named after the great circus man himself, um, was uh, incredibly important to us as the, as the commissioner and the artist, but I think also very important to the circus community itself in understanding that we were there in good faith. And Luke, again, getting back to Luke as performer, I think had a particularly uh, sensitive, a particular sensitivity to that um, because all performers um, are exploited and uh, feel taken advantage of at various points, musicians in particular. Um, in keeping with Luke's dictum, so Dolly and Pedro were instrumental not only in being a part of the project but putting us in touch with um, the living artists who became a part of the larger pro project and representative of the circus in our, in our history and heritage. Um, Luke has a great saying um, that when he's making a work of art that's a commission, um, he doesn't want to make something that could have been made in Cleveland. Um, and that is very much Luke is community-based, and he is very honoring of the community in which he is entering into to create. If he was making a work of art in Cleveland, if he was commissioning Cleveland, then it would be fine. It's not, a, not anything against Cleveland. But he wanted this to be very much about Sarasota and the Ringling. So back to a less discursive and more um, concrete notion of sight, he decided that he wanted to film um, the video at on the grounds of the Ringling. We're on 60 plus acres on Sarasota Bay, and he chose the three most iconic areas of the Ringling to do the filming. So we had a three-day film shoot in July, a two-day film shoot in July, the hottest weekend of that year, um, that's another for any students out there. Check your weather for your projects. Um, and here we have Texas Jack Fulbright, the fastest whip in the West, and his lovely assistant Kelly. And we have Pedro here. And you'll see Pedro in all of, most all of these pictures, Pedro was always present. Pedro was always there to advocate for the performers themselves. Pedro was always there to make sure that we were telling um, an authentic story of the circus and presenting them in the way that we should be presenting them. And we're in front of the Cotazan Mansion here and on the bay front directly adjacent to the Cotazan Mansion um, with the Augusta Suprema Porta, because why not? Um, here we are in the beautiful courtyard of the Ringling, which you don't get any sense of here um, because I'm just showing you details, with Duo Romanesque. Um, Duo Romanesque is really um, 
a great story because they had just graduated from Sailor Circus and were just doing their um, first professional gigs this summer. They're hand balancers, strong men. They're absolutely incredible. So again, another link to this very important history of Sarasota. So we have Duo Romanesque in the courtyard, watched over, of course, by the David, because why not? And then, in one of my favorite spaces in the museum, our 18th century Italian theater interior, the historic Oslo Theater, that our first director, Chick Austin, one of the towering intellectuals of American, of American museum history and um, just innovators, um, brought over to be used as our performance space. One of my great joys at the Ringling as the contemporary um, curator is working with my colleagues in performance to curate contemporary performance in an 18th century theater um, overlooked by, you have these um, wonderful portraits of all the great, uh, all the literary greats of Italian history, um, starting with Petrarch and going forward. Um, I show you this just so you can get a sense. This was a, about a 10 person crew. We had to work with the Sarasota Film Commission, the Florida Film Commission. Um, we had to bring in these, you get a, a sense of scale, these enormous lights into what is a work of art itself. The historic Oslo Theater is classed as an object within the museum. So we had to be very mindful of creating a work of art within a work of art. And you have Texas Jack on, on the stage um, there. I have really bad pictures of this. And again, this is um, inherent to the medium, but also this is my push for you to go next door and spend some time um, with these. Uh, what was interesting, before I move on, before I forget, what was interesting, so here you have Dolly flying through the air. You have Pedro as the ringmaster. Um, what was interesting about this is we probably could have done it all in one day if we were not inept because circus performers are unlike any other performer. Every single take is perfect. Because in the circus, if you mess up, you die, right? If you, if you fall from the rings, you can die. So every time is perfect. The reason it took two days is because of us. We were, we were the imperfect ones. They just did it over and over and over again, and every time was absolutely perfect. You have Duo Romanesque, you have Gina, which I haven't shown you, yeah, uh, shown you yet, Gina Schwarzman Cristiani, one of the great jugglers in the world, and here's Texas Jack doing the lasso because we couldn't let him do the whip in the, in the um, historic Oslo. The acoustics would have deafened us. Um, when you go over to the exhibition, I think that one of the things that you will notice is how at ease the performers are. Um, and in talking with Anne about this uh, presentation today, she brought up the good point about linking this to the history of portraiture. We have all seen portraits where the subject is anything but at ease. They look very tense. They look like they're having a terrible time. Um, perhaps that is the artist um, taking his or her um, uh, frustration out on this sitter for perpetuity. Um, but I think it's probably a larger thing, and that is the successful portrait comes out of the portrait test being able to put the subject at ease. And going back again to Luke as a performance, as a performer, as a performance artist, as a collaborator, watching him work with each of these uh, circus artists was an amazing example of how two artists can meet on equal ground and how they, the circus artists, immediately knew that they were in um, equal and respectful hands of Luke, who was himself a performance and collaborative artist. And I think um, more than anything else, uh, every time I look at this work, I'm reminded of that experience. Um, oh, I'll go back one. When you are looking at this in the galleries, you will notice that in typical Luke style, it has been shot at extremely high definition video. Um, it is then slowed down again as this kind of investigation meditation on the artist and the manipulation of perception and what you think you're seeing in a performance. It becomes an incredible archive of circus performance because certainly, um, what you see with the naked eye is not at all what is going on 
in the performance itself. You see Gina when she's spinning the hat with the batons. You see the hat bend into these incredibly abstract shapes in Luke's piece, but to the naked eye, the hat always looks perfectly round and perfectly circular. You see the straining muscles on Duo Romanesque that you don't see um, in the live performance. You see Texas Jack uh, Fulbright's whip unfold so delicately and so sinuously to a very sharp point directly at your eye, when in reality, I can tell you, all you hear is that crack and nothing else matters. Um, very interestingly, Luke doesn't stop there. Pedro is the ringmaster in real life and in the piece. All of the pieces, and you have the simultaneous, I should get back to you, you have the simultaneous narrative, you have the, simul the, the multiple shots happening within the frame, you have the typography that is based both on American and Soviet um, typographic examples, um, but then you have Pedro as ringmaster. All of the portraits key off Pedro. They're all computer-based, they're all generative. You'll never see the same combination twice of images and they're all taking their cue off Pedro the Ringmaster. Also, and I'm not sure about the installation here, but um, I think so, um, they go to sleep when they don't have an audience. There is a motion sensor, um, so that if the gallery is empty, there's no one to perform for, they slow down to an almost stop. It's only when you, the visitor, comes into the gallery that they are enlivened and, this, and the, circus, the circus artists perform for you, which I think is a really beautiful touch. Um, finally, there is an audio, uh, a, a sound, a sonic component, um, and that is historic circus music that's been slowed down to become almost microtonal and, um, uh, uh, and an, an almost abstract experience reminding you, I think again, underscoring that what you see is a very manufactured form of performance. Also reminding you that the actual performance is a very manufactured form of performance. So through sighting and collaboration, Luke brought together the seemingly opposite traditions of the Big Top and Rubens, which is the legacy of John and Mabel Ringling um, in their building of Sarasota. By using the collaborative tools of the musician and performer, Luke was able to create a lasting work that, in my opinion, captures everything I want the contemporary program at the Ringling to achieve. So I hope this has been an interesting insight into at least one piece of Luke's um, overall and impressive of. And thank you very much for being here. And I couldn't resist um, one more dig at the circus. May all your days be circus days. Um, thank you. And I think we have time for questions. I don't, maybe, yes, a little bit of time for questions, if anyone has questions. So, so. Check, test. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Um, oh, thank that you. was great. And it's really nice to hear you speak of the exhibition after having seen it mm. um, for a little bit. Um, I'm really curious, though, about the circus pieces mm. And um, for me, they read much more neutrally. Um, mm. And in other words, for me, they read as a way in which they both celebrate and are mm -hmm. also a kind of critical or at least um, uh, questioning the nostalgic impulse mm. that they kind of, um, they, they tend to, for, they, they front. Right. And so I'm wondering in, because it seems to me that the, the work, therefore, the strength of it for me was the, um, the ambivalence yeah. uh, in some ways that I felt about them in the mm -hmm. way in which they, they really showed amazing skill mm -hmm. in these performers. But at the same time, I wasn't too sure whether I could take them all together seriously. Right. And so, um, and, and it, was, it was kind of gra the grandiosity, mm -hmm. um, the over the top, the mm -hmm. Las Vegasness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm wondering in the production of this and the communications that have occurred in the wake of the pieces, mm -hmm. were there any kind of questioning, was there any kind of questioning that came up around um, whether the intention to, um, to elevate mm. um, was fully realized? That is 
I love everything you just said because it goes back to this notion of sighting and expanded notions of sighting. And so I'm giving you very much the Ringling Sarasota version. That's what all of this means to us when we see it. It's so great having your your insight into how you've received the work, not necessarily knowing any of that history and not being a part of that. Um, I have to say, um, within Sarasota, none of that came up. Um, to my knowledge, you're, it hasn't come up elsewhere, but um, you know, it's, it was, it, this work has been shown, Gina, just Gina's portrait was shown at um, Luke's solo show last year in New York City. It was actually in the storefront of the gallery on Allen Street in the Lower East Side. Um, and I, I didn't get any feedback like that from anyone, but perhaps I didn't ask the right questions, and now I, it, it really makes me want to go back and ask those questions. At Orange County, where it was, Orange County Museum of Art, right before it came here, um, I can say that at the opening when I was there, um, of course, because you're just outside of Los Angeles, the whole read seemed to be about show business and um, filming show business. And so they were reading it very much um, from that perspective, which I found fascinating. I, I forgot to say, Luke has the best description of circus performer, uh, circus artists, and I really try very hard to say that because they are great artists. They are great contemporary artists. Um, they're some of the most intimidating people I have ever been around <laughs> because they are so perfect in every way. And they, there is something very, um, in the best possible way, animal about them because of the way they use their bodies in such specific ways. Um, and they are so intelligent about speaking about that as well. But Luke says, um, circus performers are just like movie stars, but they're better than movie stars because they don't need the movie. And there is something about that to them. These people are movies. They live like movie stars. They are, well, they, they, they are movie stars. They have that bearing, and I think that, that that's what they picked up on in Orange County. So it's so interesting to hear your perception in Maine. Um, and this is another thing that, you know, the circus being sightless, the circus being itinerant, the circus traveling, it, it becomes, I think, a very interesting question about what does the circus mean in each particular location where it sets down and how is it interpreted differently? And I think your question brings that up. So I don't think I'm answering you at all very well. Um, I don't think that I know the answer. Um, but I think the sightlessness, perhaps, that I was trying to talk about a bit speaks to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Just to riff off of that for a second, mm -hmm. um, Matthew, you brought a new way of, of thinking about that particular piece, but also the circus in general, mm. with your observation about Baroque art. Yeah. And I'd never, although I'd even been to the Ringling, I hadn't equated that with um, the showiness and um, grandiosity of the yeah. circus itself. And um, it's interesting to think about the degree to which the Baroque may in fact have set the stage for the circus, mm. um, maybe rather than the other way around in, mm. in some sense. But I was curious when you worked with Luke, particularly on mm -hmm. those pieces, did he, to your knowledge, think about the Baroque context of the rest of the collection? And I'm thinking about the frames he did, and the colors. And, and yeah, and I, I probably didn't tease that out enough as I was speaking. So back to the Strobridge posters, and I talked about how there were sometimes literal framings within the posters. Luke was very much thinking about that aspect of the visual culture, the circus poster, where that occurred, but he was also very much thinking about our big, gilded, over-the-top frames that you see throughout, and linking those two together very much in his mind. And then again, that what was so crucial to all of us and that this is for the Museum of Art. We are showing the circus as an art form in the same museum where we're showing Rubens as an art form. And I think that that was very definitely a way of tying that together um, in, a, in a fairly circuitous way. Yeah, definitely. Anything else? So when I see um, 
when I see your Rubens and mm -hmm. I see the people in the mm -hmm. Rubens, I often think, um, I wonder if they really looked like yeah. that. <laughs> and kind of speaking to your comment or your question, um, it, it, it always kind of make, brings me around to thinking about the time that you live in mm. and how it affects what we mm -hmm. actually see. And, um, you know, you really can't um, get away from that. Absolutely. Um, so, and, and in thinking about those Rubens, I was thinking about, well, the circus performers, you know, certainly must bear a resemblance to the people mm. in the Rubens. So I'm wondering if you could just comment uh, or say something about, you know, how the time we are in hmm. influences how we perceive things. And do you think the people in the Rubens really looked like that in their time? Wow, that's almost a metaphysical question. Uh, um, I don't, I, I think that all artists take artist, ar artistic license. Um, so I'm sure Rubens would have taken artistic license um, in the presentation of his figures to some extent. Uh, Luke takes artistic license in the presentation of the circus. They are, it's not, it's crazy high definition cameras that we used, yet they are kind, it's a very soft focus. He did that um, intentionally as, uh, again, uh, reminding us of manipulation and perception, I think. Um, you know, Again, gosh, it seems to get, go down not only to time, but to sight. I think when you see these works at the Ringling, those associations become very easy to make because of the costuming of the Rubens, the elaborate, the Baroque, this elaborately Baroque costuming and wonderful um, you know, drapery that Rubens is so known for. Um, and then I should say, you know, someone like, let me see if I can get back enough you can kind of maybe not see too well when you go over and look at them and you've you've looked at them you know gina is in this incredible you know sequenced get up she popped out of her car like that um for the film shoot and it was kind of one of those moments where again they're movie stars she showed up just perfect and ready um, and so, you know, what associations we have with that today, certainly we have all sorts of cultural associations that we lay on that today. I think one of, you know, in, in Hollywood, at Orange County, they saw it as Hollywood. You know, probably in New York, I'll speak for New York, um, they might have seen this as Las Vegas. I mean, there's something of, that's one of the places that these costumes still exist, right? And there's certainly a great deal of artistry in Las Vegas, too. So, again, it depends on site and it depends on time. If you're at the Ringling, you associate it with Rubens. Here, I don't know, what might you associate it with in Maine, not L.L. Bean. It's as far away from L.L. Bean as you can possibly get as Gina and her juggling outfit. Um, but no, does that kind of get to what you're to what you're thinking of? Sort of what? Um, yeah, and that that could be. You know, okay. I think I, I think I see what you're saying there. Um, this was very much to present them as they are on stage. Um, how the, how they are off stage. Um, I don't know that they're very interested in presenting that to you. They are, they are artists, they are performers. This is, this is who they want you to see. This, I, I, and I, this is a great question. I wish I had all of you when we were doing this. Um, this is a great question, um, but I think I can safely say this is how they would want to be presented. This is how they want to be remembered. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm, right? mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I wondered if, you know, in your conversations with Luke, whether you thought about uh, presenting this as an alternate non-museum space. 
Yeah, you know, we didn't. Again, I really wanted to stress it was very important, at least for the initial showing, to have this in the Museum of Art because I wanted to send a very strong message that I consider them great artists. As the as the curator, as the museum, I wanted to, you know, for good or for bad, the museum still plays a large role in forming the canon, and I want to provide them, for good or for bad, that legitimization, not that they need any legitimization from me, but I want people who might be skeptical and say they're just performers or say they're, they're, you know, all of these negative associations that they've had to deal with, I want to make sure that they know I don't see any of those when I'm working with them and I see them as equal artists to Luke who I'm doing this big show with. So for me it was very important symbolically to have them in the galleries in the Museum of Art. That's not to say that later iterations absolutely could 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 take that on. I think that that could be very interesting. Luke does a lot of display in non-traditional spaces. He did, um, you have the, the Snell and I charts of hindsight is 2020. Originally, those were huge light boxes that he has just subsequently recreated. Those were huge light boxes that were on the grounds of the 2008 uh, Democratic National Convention. So he absolutely um, has worked. He also does a lot of his performance work in very non-traditional spaces. Um, it is certainly something that could be explored. It does have the look of advertising. I'll say that when Gina's work was um, up at the gallery at his show at Bitforms last year, in that storefront window on Allen Street, it did it exactly look like. It looked like a 19th century poster come to life, which was really fabulous. Um, so I would certainly be open to exploring that, and Luke would certainly be open to exploring that. But I thought for the first showing and for this tour, it was important symbolically um, to have that. No, I, I completely agree, but I think it's interesting to think about the implications yeah. of taking performance work or work that has been digitally born mm -hmm. and experimenting with the different kind of uh, platforms by which... I absolutely agree. And one of the things I should also say is that um, you know, in working with these performer, with these artists, it was a collaboration, and um, Luke provided them all of the high definition footage that they wanted of that he took of them, and that might not sound like a lot, but when you're a performer, getting that level, getting an entire film crew and a brilliant um, director of photography, Aaron Henderson and brilliant lighters to do this super high definition that you can then use on your website, your, your advertising, your, so that actually exists separately for the artists themselves to use how they may, and then that becomes a very interesting dialogue, I think, with, with the, the, the museum piece. But, I mean, I'm thinking further, because then I'll be really helpful yeah. to you, because I think that that's the brilliance of the work, yeah. is the fact that it's so multivalent, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the neutrality of it and the, mm. the different ways in which it could, it could go, mm -hmm. um, you kind of kind of have to choose. Yeah. Right? And so um, I think that's a, one, of the, one of the best parts about it um, Great. is that it, it, plays its, it plays its card really straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, really straight. Um, good. And I think Luke... I, straight faced, I, Luke, Luke is a really good guy and he really wanted to honor them. He really wanted to do right by them. We all did. And I think that's exactly what you're picking up on. And I think it's the, it's the, it's the um, road to hell that the pays good intentions. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think there was one more question in the back. Um, I just want to say, um, I really want to thank you and Luke for doing this at the Ringling. Um, I, my father brought me to the Ringling in Sarasota <laughs> for five times before I finally moved to Sarasota. Oh. <laughs> and that place is magical to me. Oh, and I you. can't wait to see this. And I haven't been back for four years, but yeah. I just can't wait to see it there. And part of the magic of um, Kadzan and mm and the museum and the whole place is the water to me. Yeah. Um, that water, that Sarasota Bay is just so special. 
It's yeah. great. And actually, I'm glad you bring up the water because in one of the shot, uh, uh, Dolly, um, and again, you can't see the costuming really well here. Dolly is, um, so there, and I should have made this point too, you have the performance, the performances that they do, but in between the performances, they do what's called styling in the circus. That's the ta-da moment. And so Luke had them all do their styling as well. And there is a wonderful, one of the clips is of Dolly styling on the Katazan Circus, or, or on the Katazan Terrace, excuse me, with Sarasota Bay shimmering like millions of diamonds in the background. It's just like, it takes your breath away because you have this, you know, incredibly brilliant and exquisite human with this incredibly brilliant and exquisite background. And it's really one of the beautiful parts of the entire piece. So look for that. And thank you. The, this, um, the, the ringling really is incredible. Thank you all. I've talked way too long. Thank you.